Hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to my channel. Y'all, today has been such a weird day. I've had to do my makeup three times, and I have had to record this intro like six times. <laughs> my stomach hurt earlier, and it's it's just been a weird day. Is, is there something with the stars going on right now? Because that's kind of how I'm feeling right now. So... Today we're gonna be talking about a true crime case, obviously, because that's why you're here. So, last week, remember we talked about that awful, awful woman? And I said at the end of that video that I was gonna try and find a case that's much lighter. And this one's kind of lighter. It doesn't go into nearly as much child abuse as this one. Do y'all remember the Megan Meyer case? It was like all over the news back in 2006 when it happened. It kind of was one of the first true crime cases that I really kept up with. And I remember it was a huge reason that a lot of kids my age weren't allowed to have my spaces. Anyway, that's the case we're going to be talking about today. So, if you are new here, my name is Cammie, and if you don't know what I do, I like to cover true crime cases that other channels haven't really covered because there are the bigger cases that other people have covered so it's kind of like you know what else could I add to it so I am going to stop blabbering and I am going to get right into the video Megan Taylor Meyer was born November 6 1992 in O'Fallon Missouri which if you don't know where O'Fallon is it's like a suburb of um where's that big city in Missouri st. Louis st. Louis so it's a suburb of St. Louis, and she was the oldest child born to Tina and Ron Meyer. Megan was a 13-year-old girl, and she suffered from low self-esteem, and she was on some medications for some mental health issues from between 2001 and 2002. Tina had decided to bring her to get, um, like, therapy to be put on these medications after she, after Megan told her that she was having suicidal thoughts. So she was under the care of this psychiatrist and they had prescribed her citalopram, I think that's how you say it, which is an antidepressant that has a higher risk of increasing suicidal thoughts in young people. And she was also on Ritalin and Geo Geodon, is I think what it's called. And basically those are used to treat bipolar disorder, ADD and um, schizophrenia. So she had been diagnosed with ADD and depression and a lot of her self-esteem issues came from her weight as a lot of young girls, especially 13 year olds. I know I had a lot of self-confidence issues regarding my weight whenever I was that age. But even so, her parents described her as a goofy, real bubbly girl, even with her mental health issues. So throughout her youth, Megan had attended several different schools and in the school, she would try and befriend the popular girls because the boys would tend to pick on her. And she really tried to befriend these popular girls because she really kind of just wanted the bullying to stop. And for a while it worked until the popular girls decided they were gonna turn against Megan. And after they turned against Megan, the bullying picked up, except it was like 10 times worse. So in 2006, Megan was going into eighth grade and her parents enrolled her in a private Catholic school in Darden Prairie, Missouri, which is only about 10 minutes away from where they lived in O'Fallon. And this school was called Immaculate Conception Catholic School. So Megan did have this one friend named Sarah that she lived next door to. And I don't know if her name was, was Sarah or if that's just what they've called her because every single documentary I watched regarding this case referred to this girl as Sarah. And I don't know if they called her that because she was a minor at the time or if that was her real name, but either way, we're gonna call her Sarah. So Megan and Sarah had been friends their whole life, but once they hit eighth grade, they just kind of started to drift apart and it wasn't really any like, they didn't really have a fight. It's just sometimes whenever you have friends that you've been friends with for a very long time, you just drift apart. And that's kind of what was happening with Megan and Sarah. So Sarah's mom's name was Lori Drew, and everyone in the Meyer family didn't really like Lori Drew, according to them. Um, Allison said in one of the documentaries that they all just really thought that Lori was kind of annoying, but they put up with her because she was Sarah's mom. So in 2006, MySpace. Y'all remember MySpace? Probably not. Well, people my age will probably remember, but younger people won't. MySpace was like the big thing. It was like Facebook, and how popular it is now. 
everyone had a MySpace or everyone wanted a MySpace. Just like any other 13 year old girl around this time, Megan begged her mom to let her have one and Tina says that she was really, really worried about letting Megan have a MySpace because she had heard at this point, all in the news, it was all about all these like children getting kidnapped or abducted because of people they met on MySpace. So Tina, like any parent at that time was really wary about letting Megan have one. And on top of that, Megan had dealt with bullying. So that was kind of another reason that Tina was worried about letting her have one. But eventually Tina did give in and let Megan have a MySpace, but she said that there were going to be rules surrounding her MySpace. Tina was the only one to have the password and that Tina would be the one to log Megan in and out. So Megan wasn't allowed to use it whenever Tina wasn't home and Tina could watch her. Now, Ron also had the password to this MySpace, but he didn't really deal with any of it. So it was mostly Tina that was monitoring Megan whenever she was on MySpace. Pretty much it was all normal rules that any parent who has a child that uses the internet would instill in their child if they were going on social media. So one day Megan gets this friend request from this 16 year old boy named Josh Evans. Now keep in mind, Megan is 13. So rightfully, Tina was really wary about it. She said, you know, Megan, do you know him? And Megan was like, no mom, I don't know him, but he's really cute. Can I please accept this friend request? And Tina said, okay, you can accept this guy, Josh Evans, onto your friends list. But if anything inappropriate starts happening, you have to delete him right away. So Megan agreed to it. So Megan starts talking to Josh and she kind of starts to really get to know him. And he tells her that he comes from a broken home and that he's homeschooled. So he doesn't go to public school. You know what homeschooling is. So at one point, Tina gets onto Megan's account and she was very upfront from the beginning with Josh. She said, you know, this is Megan's mom, Tina. I kind of want to know what your intentions are with my daughter because we still don't know who you are. So Josh actually responded and said, you know, I understand why you're worried, but you don't have anything to worry about. Tina thought that was kind of strange that he didn't just blow up on her and be like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't appreciate you doing this. She just said it was kind of weird that he didn't like lose his mind and start just yelling at her over messages. So Tina tells Megan that she had talked to Josh and Megan got really, really upset and basically said that, you know, you're gonna scare Josh off. And she just kind of got into a fight with her mom over it. And it made Tina very, very suspicious that Josh still continued to talk to Megan after this conversation that she had with him. At this point, Tina was just kind of desperate to find out if this guy that Megan was talking to was a real person to the point that at one point she had actually called the police so that way they could maybe try and track him down, see if he's a real person. But the police had told her that there wasn't anything they could do unless Josh had directly threatened Megan, which he didn't. Even a family friend said that this was weird and they thought for sure that, you know, Tina calling the police regarding Josh would have scared him off, but it still didn't. He still continued to talk to Megan. And at this point, Tina just really wanted Josh Evans to just go away but she knew if she told Megan to delete him that Megan would just go behind her back and find a way to talk to him. And she really didn't want that. She wanted it to be an open line of communication and trust between her and Megan. So about a month goes by of Megan and Josh talking and eventually they form this relationship and things seem to be going really, really well. But then one day things just kind of changed between Megan and Josh or specifically, Things changed on Josh's end. One day when Megan was sitting down to do the invitations to her 14th birthday, she got this message on MySpace from Josh. So this message that she got from Josh said, I don't wanna be your friend anymore. And I've heard you're not a nice person. And Tina just told Megan, you know, he's probably having a bad day. Don't worry about it. You know, he is a 16 year old boy. And Megan did still respond to him and asked him where he had heard that from. And he didn't respond to that message. So the next day, Megan gets home from school and tells Tina, you know, I want to get on MySpace. And Tina had told her only for a few minutes because she had to bring her younger daughter, Allison, to the orthodontist. So she logs on to MySpace for Megan and before Tina could get to the door, Megan was upset. Josh had sent her multiple messages that said, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I've heard that you're not very nice to your friends. 
And he had also been sending more and more messages to her. So it was just a, like a barricade of messages. He had also sent messages to other kids from Megan's old school. He was just kind of getting all these kids from her old school to join in on this like this train of just saying awful things about Megan. They're, they were calling her names. They were saying how mean of a person she was. And it was really making Megan upset. On top of that, people, including Josh, had also posted bulletins talking about just how awful Megan was, which if you don't know what a bulletin is, if you weren't around in the MySpace days, it's kind of like a blog post. So anyone could go to your profile and they could see these bulletins that you've written on your profile and they could read them and they could comment on them. So like I said, kind of like a blog post or like a Twitter post or maybe even like a status update on Facebook. Tina tells Megan to sign off and then leaves to go bring Allison to her orthodontist appointment. But later Tina had called Megan to see if she had logged off. And at this point, Megan was in hysterics because she hadn't logged off. And at this point, Megan was firing back at the people that were saying all these mean things about her saying, you know, I'm not these things, you're these things. And it just, it was very, very, very messy. Tina was furious that Megan had responded in this way. And Tina made sure to tell Megan, you know, why didn't you log on, log off whenever I told you to? And Megan took that to mean that Tina wasn't on her side. But really, it was the opposite. Tina was very, very, very worried about Megan. The last message sent by Josh said, everybody in O'Fallon knows who you are. You're a bad person and everybody hates you. Have a shitty rest of your life. The world would be a better place without you. To which Megan responded to that saying, you're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. And these last exchanges were made via AOL Instant Messenger, which is kind of like Facebook Messenger now, except it's not connected to like any kind of account. You just make your own account and message through there. Instant messaging was like kind of how everyone talked back in probably from like 2002 until 2000. Nine is when I last remember using specifically AOL Instant Messenger. So that was kind of how everyone talked. And that's where these messages were sent through. So when Megan was going upstairs, she actually ran into her father, Ron, and she just kind of ran past him, told him about what was going on, and ran upstairs to her room and closed and locked the door. And Ron came downstairs and Tina at this point was already home and Tina and Ron talked about the cyberbullying and what they should do about the MySpace account. About 20 minutes later, as Tina is making dinner and she and Ron are talking about what they should do about the MySpace situation, Tina says she just got this awful feeling in the pit of her stomach that she just kind of froze. And she went upstairs to Megan's room, opened the door, and found Megan hanging from the closet by a belt. So, Tina lets out this horrifying scream. Allison has said in the documentaries that it's the worst sound she's ever heard in her entire life. Ron is trying to cut Megan down, and as he's trying to cut Megan down, Tina has her in this, like, bear hug and is trying to lift her up to try and alleviate some of that pressure that's on her neck because at this point they don't know how long she's been hanging there. So they thought maybe that if, I guess she thought if she had lifted her up a little bit, it would give her some oxygen. And as this is going on, Allison has run next door to get their neighbor who was trained in CPR. And this neighbor says that whenever he saw Allison saying, you know, Megan's not breathing, he thought maybe it was like an, like an allergic reaction to one of her medicines. So at this point, Megan is down and they're doing CPR. They're giving her chest compressions and Ron is just screaming, you know, saying, please wake up. And Tina is just running around outside in circles in the rain on the phone with 911 saying that her daughter's not breathing. So when the neighbor got there, Megan wasn't breathing on her own and she had no pulse. And 911 shows up and despite numerous attempts to try and revive her, Megan was sadly pronounced dead the next day on October 17th, just three weeks before her 14th birthday. The first responders said that Megan had probably been without oxygen for about 20 minutes. So she probably ended up hanging herself as soon as she got upstairs. Now, if that was the end of the story, we wouldn't be here, but 
this gets so much worse than just a young girl's suicide, and we're about to explain why it gets worse. Several weeks go by, and Tina and Ron have really been trying to get information about this Josh Evans guy, because at this point, the profile had been taken down. Like, it was taken down as soon as he had sent those awful messages to Megan that ended up causing her to take her own life. So because he had ended up deleting his MySpace account, there was no record of the messages. And back when MySpace was a thing, when someone deleted their MySpace account, it's not like with Facebook, where when someone deactivates their account, it's not deleted. So you can still access all the messages from this deactivated account. With MySpace, when you deleted your account, it was gone forever. All your pictures were gone, all your friends were gone, your whole profile was gone. So you would have to make an entirely new account if you wanted to get back onto MySpace. You couldn't just log back into your account and reactivate it like you can with Facebook. Sadly, everything was turning up a dead end, though. They couldn't find any, like, names in the phone book. They couldn't find any information about this Josh Evans guy. At one point, Lori Drew, you know, Sarah's mom, had invited the Myers over to Sarah's birthday party because Sarah's birthday was a few days after Megan's was. And they decided that they were, go well, Tina and Ron decided that they were going to go because they knew that that's what Megan would have wanted. They also thought that Sarah was probably struggling with Megan's death because, you know, these two girls were very, very close friends. And even though they had drifted apart, they were they still considered themselves to be like close friends with each other. So after Megan died, Tina and Ron had started going to these like group therapy sessions for parents of children who have sadly taken their own lives. And they were about to go to one of these sessions when they got this phone call from this neighbor named Michelle Mulford. And Michelle Mulford told them, you know, come over, I have information about Megan's death. And originally they said they weren't gonna go, but eventually something made them change their minds. Like, I think Michelle had insisted that they come over because it was very important that they come. So they go to this neighbor's house. And oh boy. So Michelle tells them that Josh Evans isn't real. And at this point, Tina and Ron already knew that. So they're like, yes, we know he's not real. If he was real, we would have found some information about him. But Michelle tells them that not only is Josh not real, he was made up by Lori Drew, Sarah, and an 18-year-old employee of Lori Drew's named Ashley Grills. And they made this fake account in retaliation for Megan spreading gossip about Sarah and that the original plan was to gather information about her and use it to humiliate her. The original plan was they were going to have Josh invite Megan to the mall where they would then approach Megan once she got there and they were all gonna line up and laugh at her. And no one knows what made her change the plan, but Lori and Sarah apparently had been heard bragging about this. So once they learned this, they drove home in silence. And once their garage door opened, they saw a present that Lori had been keeping in their garage. And it was supposed to be a Christmas present for Sarah. And they just lost it. So it was this foosball table. And as soon as they saw that foosball table, they just began destroying it. And once they were done, they threw the remains in Lori's front yard and spray painted Merry fucking Christmas on it. Lori came over after she saw the remains of this foosball table in her front yard and was just kind of like, like, why'd you do this? Why would you do that? <laughs> As if this woman didn't just cause their daughter's suicide. But apparently Tina says that when she saw Lori walking over, <laughs> she wanted to kill her and that Ron had to hold her back, physically grab her by the waist and be like, you know, don't do this. You've still got another daughter you need to worry about. And honestly, I'd probably react the same if I were in Tina's shoes. <laughs> what does Lori Drew do next? She apologizes, right? She says, hmm, I'm sorry for causing your daughter suicide. No. That's not at all what Lori Drew decides that she's going to do. Lori Drew decided that she was going to call the police on the Meyer family for destroying their property. I'm laughing because I can't believe the nerve of this woman. You know, you just caused the suicide of these people's children and 
You're going to call the police on them. All right, Lori. All right. I don't use this word lightly, but this woman's a sociopath. This sociopath really killed these parents' child and had the nerve to call the cops on them for destroying a foosball table. Thankfully, though, the police did not press charges against the Myers. And I feel so bad for Tina and Ron. Allison, too. <laughs> this woman is so cold and callous, she gets my blood boiling. And Tina actually tells the cops, you know, she's lucky that that's all I destroyed was this foosball table. So it was actually about a year between Megan's suicide and the first media report of Lori being behind the Josh account. And the reason for this is because the FBI had instructed the Myers not to say anything about it because they were investigating it and they wanted to see, you know, what charges they could bring against Lori Drew. Shortly after the first anniversary of Megan's death, her aunt Vicki Dunn actually came across an article about internet harassment written by Steve Pokin of the Suburban Journals, and that was when she contacted him to tell him about Megan's story. Once this story broke, it opened up like the floodgates. Every single news outlet had a hold of this story, and when I say news outlet, I mean international and national news. So this story was everywhere. So a lot of parents were associating this story with everyone's experience with MySpace. And once this happened is kind of when a ton of parents really started cracking down on what their children did on the internet. So there was a press conference held on December 3rd, 2007. And at this press conference, the prosecuting attorney of St. Charles County, which is where Megan had lived, his name is Jack Bannis. Bannis? Bannis? Jack Bannis said that Lori Drew's 18-year-old temporary employee, Ashley Grills, was the one who wrote most of the Josh Evans messages. Additionally, Ashley Grills was also who wrote the final Josh Evans message to Megan. That awful message that said the world would be a better place if you just killed yourself. Which is very, very, very sad. Especially in hindsight. Ashley said that she had wrote the final message to try and end this MySpace hoax and to get Megan to stop communicating with this Josh Evans guy. Jack Bannis said that he did not interview Ashley Grills because at the time she was under psychiatric treatment for her involvement in the Josh Evans thing in the Megan Meyer case and he didn't plan to interview at her interview her at a later date. And I didn't even I, I don't know if she checked herself in to get the psychiatric care. I don't know if someone else did, but it's, apparently she was under psychiatric care for this whole thing. Now, the Myers actually criticized this statement and said that Jack Bannis didn't interview anyone besides the Drews for this Josh Evans thing and that Jack was solely relying on the testimony of Lori and Sarah. Jack also said that the original FBI investigation into the matter was um, when Ashley was interviewed and that this really is what established Ashley's role in the whole Josh Evans case. And the Myers have since come out and said that they don't hold Ashley um, responsible for Megan's death, which, okay, here's my opinion. I understand that Ashley was an 18 year old, that she was technically a legal adult, but there was still, there was still an improper power dynamic. So I'm wondering if maybe they thought that that had come into play when it came to um, Ashley writing these messages because Lori was Ashley's employer. So it's possible that they thought maybe that Ashley believed that if she didn't write these messages that Lori would fire her. But that's just my opinion. Jack Bannis said that Sarah Drew, who was 15 at the time of this, was attending a different school and was not living in this Darden Prairie place. And he also said that Lori Drew was fearful of her life and that she had to close her advertising business as well as she was additionally shunned by her neighbors. Which, you can call me what you want, you can call me a bitch if you want, but I don't feel sorry for this woman. 
internet webloggers actually posted like the emails of the Drews and of Ashley and they posted their phone numbers and they posted photos of them. So they essentially got doxxed. So remember how I said that Lori actually had to close her advertising business? That's because she couldn't get anyone to work with her because any time that a business would put their like, um, their business name in this like coupon book that she sold, they would just lose a ton of business. And understandably so, I, if I was a business owner, I wouldn't wanna be associated with this monster sociopath woman. So Sarah Wells, who was the web logger that like released all the names of um, Lori Drew and like her family and the employee has said she doesn't regret naming Lori. <laughs> and I love that, honestly. So after reviewing the case, county prosecutors decided they were not going to file any criminal charges against Lori Drew in regards to the hoax. That's right, you heard that right. They said they were not going to prosecute this woman, this monster, for causing the death of this child. And I think that's the thing that gets me the most angry. Well, that and the fact that she killed this child. But this is one of the things that makes me the most angry about this case. However, Lori Drew was indicted and convicted by a jury in violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in 2008 over the whole MySpace hoax. Even with that, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's ridiculous. Her conviction was vacated by a federal judge on a post-trial verdict. So if you don't know anything about the legal system, a jury can find someone guilty of something, but a judge can be like, no. So. Ultimately, the judge kind of has the final say in what happens to someone. And I remember there was like a whole SVU episode where something like that happened. It's the, the name of the episode is Porn Stars Requiem if you ever want to go watch it. But it's very, very rage inducing, just, just so you know. The reason that this verdict was overturned is because um, they said that, or the judge said that the computer... I'm sorry, I have the name of the act written down because I, I have like one brain cell and the attention span of a goldfish. So I've got the name of this act written down. So he said that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act did not intend to criminalize the conduct for the, what Lori Drew was accused of. So essentially they said that it wasn't meant, I guess that means that it wasn't meant to criminalize like private behavior or more specifically it wasn't meant to criminalize lying about who you are on the internet and the government chose not to appeal this post-trial ruling so in other words this grown ass woman bullied this child into killing herself and she completely got away with it there's a few cases that get me very 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 angry angela mcanalty is one of them. Uh, Rachel Pfizer, Sylvia Likens, and Casey Anthony are like my top cases that just get me angry. And this one is like up there with, well, not quite up there, but this one is, is pretty high with it. I hate this woman. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because it's, it's just, just this whole thing is ridiculous because after the ruling was sent down, according to Jack Bannis, Lori Drew said she felt horrible about the whole thing, which too little too late, you weren't feeling too horrible, horrible about it when you were bullying this child. A vigil was held for Megan Meyer on November 24th, 2007, where a crowd gathered in a parking lot and walked past the homes of Megan Meyer and Lori Drew. Um, a small piece of ground adjacent to the Drew's home was the scene of remembrance by friends and family. And on the bright side, yes, there is a bright side in this case. Laws have actually been changed because of this case. This case has caused several jurisdictions to enact or consider legislation prohibiting harassment over the internet. So anti-cyberbullying laws. The Board of Aldermen for the city of Darden Prairie passed an ordinance on November 22nd, 2007 in response to the whole Megan Meyer case. And it prohibits any harassment that utilizes an electronic medium, including the internet, text messaging service, pagers, 
and similar devices. And violations of this ordinance are treated as misdemeanors with fines of up to $500 and up to 90 days imprisonment. And again, I have my notes down here because there's a lot of, there's like a lot of bills that were passed. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm trying to get the exact language of these bills that were passed right. The city of Florissant, Missouri also passed a cyber harassment law, and after they passed the cyber harassment law, a bunch of other municipalities, um, counties, and states passed them as well. The state of Missouri also revised its harassment laws in response to the case, and they updated them to cover harassment through computers and mobile phone messaging. And it basically created a whole new crime to cover adults 21 and over harassing children under the age of 18. This new legislation went into effect on August 28th, 2008, and it was intended to cover loopholes in the current law. Uh, According to the St. Louis Daily Record, the new language expands the definition of the crime of harassment to include knowingly intimidating or causing emotional distress anonymously either by phone or electronically or causing distress to a child. And that's the exact wording that they use. It also increases the penalty for harassment from a misdemeanor to a felony and it carries up to four years in prison if it's committed by an adult against someone 17 or younger or if the criminal has previously been convicted of harassment. This is actually one of the first comprehensive laws that protects both children and adults from cyber stalking and cyber harassment on social networking sites. So this bill is actually a reaction to Lori Drew's case dismissal and the governor that signed it in is named Matt Blunt. When he signed the bill into law, he said that Missouri needs to protect its children better. And I agree, if they had had a law like this when Megan was still alive, then maybe something could have been done. So on April 2nd, 2009, a bill was introduced into the 111th Congress as H.R. 1966. Now what I'm about to read is an exact wording of what the bill says. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at my notes, so that way I can say it exactly as the bill is written. On May 15th, 2008, both houses of the Missouri State Legislature voted unanimously to pass Megan's Law. And what Megan's Law is, is it criminalizes usage of the internet to harass someone, and it also expands the existing statute to prohibit abusive communication by any means. And on May 22nd, 2008, Congresswoman Linda T. Sanchez introduced H.R. 6123 as the Megan Meyer Cyberbullying Prevention Act to amend Title 18 United States Code with respect to cyberbullying. I was never gonna remember that if I wasn't looking down, so I'm, I'm sorry. Tina Meyer also started what's known as the Megan Meyer Foundation, which is headquartered in Chesterfield, Missouri. And the Megan Meyer Foundation states that it exists to promote awareness, education, and promote positive change to children, parents, and educators in response to the ongoing bullying and cyberbullying in our children's daily environment. So, while this is a very, very sad story, there were some positive things to come out of this because, in my opinion, this essentially changed internet laws as we know it. And that is the story of Megan Meyer. (sighs) This one is one that I have known about for a very long time. And it was just really sad. I was around Megan's age in 2006. She was a year older than me. I was born in 93. She was born in 92. And as a kid, when I heard about this case, you know, me and so many other people were like, you know, why can't we have a MySpace just because of this one situation? But now as an adult, it's like I look back and, you know, that's that's really such kind of a, like, kid worry is worrying about why can't I have a MySpace. But as an adult, you look back and it's just really sad. What do you guys think of this one? Do you think that Lori Drew should have gotten some jail time? Do you think she should have at least had to pay, you know, damages to Megan's family? Do you agree with not punishing her because of their reasoning that it would cause anyone to lie on the internet to have to serve jail time? I want to know what you guys think, so let me know down in the comments below. 
and I will see you all in my next video. Bye!